uh, who's using EHCash in production? Who's using Terracotta in production? We should talk after. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly what I want to get to tonight is what is EHCash? A lot of people know a good 50% of EHCash, but they don't know the you know the why is of EHCash. Why is it designed this way? Why does it have all of these interfaces? And why is it modular the way it is? <coughs> they also don't know what it can't do or what it's not doing for them. And that's where Terracotta comes in. So, um, of course, Terracotta owns EHCash, right? We bought it uh, August 4th, 2009. Terracotta is open source, EHCash is open source. And we'll sort of spend tonight talking about. EHCash, the marriage of EHCash and Terracotta in detail. What is the Terracotta server array? What are the new things we've brought to bear in the approximately 10 months we've owned EHCash, et cetera, right? Is there anything you guys want to cover that you don't see here? I have this other deck on cloud, and since we're in Seattle where, you know, Amazon folks hang out, um, we're doing a lot of work with Amazon on EC2 right now. I can talk in detail about the cloud. I can uh, cover other stuff as well. Anyone see anything? I'd like to hear about deployment options. And uh, like, you know, for example, in my case, one of the reasons that we didn't use Terracotta was we have a 24 server high available like you know, server system, and we, we have rolling uh, uh, basically deployed. And having two versions of the client running at the same time was like no made it difficult for us to like you no know, make our system highly available. Okay. So the question was uh, deployment options. I'll cover. I'll try to sprinkle that throughout the talk, um, and then I'll come back to it at the end. And if I don't cover it, just ask me again. Any other specific questions? Let's get two or three more questions that people came here tonight hoping to get answered. <coughs> So how do you compare EHCash with the other distributed caching How do we compare EHCash with the other distributed caching problem? Did you have any? I interrupted you, sorry. Let's say Do you work for one of those companies? <laughs> <laughs> it differently if you work for <laughs> I'll be extremely deferential. If we don't work for one of them, then I'll give you the true answer. Okay, we'll cover that. That's in the talk to some extent. One more. Anyone? Well, distributed transactions in the uh, EHCash. Distributed transactions in the EHCash. We covered that in the talk. So we'll get to all of those. Let's get into it. So, in terms of history, EHCash and Terracotta are sort of like really comfortable bedfellows. They started within two months of each other in 2003. EHCash in October, Terracotta in December. Terracotta was in garage mode for a solid four years. You guys heard a lot of buzz from us. We kind of, you know, went to market a little too fast without product. In 05, 06, we, Cameron, Purdy, and I from Tangus All Days used to slug it out on the server side and make fools of ourselves in public. Uh, but we really weren't doing much that back then except building the core, right? So we got the core done in December 06. Terracotta's been open source ever since then. Uh, the license on Terracotta is pretty fr friendly. It's called the Terracotta Public License. Basically, just think Mozilla. If your legal guys want to get involved, you can use Terracotta for free. The only thing you can't do is resell Terracotta. Uh, EHCash, on the other hand, is Apache, so you can do whatever you want, pretty much. We put half of our work into EHCash. We're not shy to give it away. We put the other half into Terracotta. Um, what else is, is important to you guys? So, why did we buy EHCash? I think that's something that you guys should understand. Anyone who wants to ask about competitive options or consider EHCash and Terracotta together needs to understand why we bought it. And the answer is simple. We had this notion before EHCash of transparency. We wanted to cluster applications in pure config. And so we built 
extensions to the JVM itself to be able to do that. And the short of it turned out to be that no one understood what we had brought to market. It was very sexy, and we got a lot of press, but there were maybe one in a thousand downloaders were actually getting into production, and that's terracotta. So when we go to cluster EH cache, we went to cluster EH cache using pure config because that's what our platform is capable of. And when I say pure config, I'm not even going to explain it because it's so off the wall. But <laughs> it's, it's bytecode manipulation in short, and it's literally capable of changing an application so it's clustered at runtime. Uh, and it's not just weaving in calls to serialization, it's actually replicating the memory across JVMs. So we clustered EH cache that way, it was too slow. And that's why, you know, we bought EH cache, we changed the internals, we made it work better. So why did we do that? Because we still want to be transparent, we still want to be simple. But we realized transparent and drop in are not synonyms for each other. Transparent is what we built. We literally did not see Terracotta there in your app. An app would run in Java and it would run in Java with a dash x boot class path prepending Terracotta's boot jar library. Then all of a sudden it was a clustered app and you could go switch gears between the two modes and it was transparent, right? But again, no one got what transparent clustering meant. It meant multi-threaded programming extended to multi-process. And so when we bought EH Cache, we realized Everyone's using EH cache, like we saw tonight when I asked for a show of hands. Everyone's using Hibernate, which, by the way, ships with EH cache. And if you're not using Hibernate or EH cache, you're still using a container. Tomcat, Jetty, TC Server, T TCAT, WebLogic, WebSphere. We can cluster in sessions in those things. But we realized drop-in is really go take the frameworks that people's apps rely on and make those <coughs> things scale well. And that way you have a constrained problem. Instead of going to every application, which is like a snowflake, and asking each of them to conform to some model, you're going to the frameworks they use and asking those to conform to some model. So we <coughs> went ahead and identified the list of use cases that we could make scale better, and that's Quartz, CH Cache, Hibernate, Session. And we set about buying all of them. Obviously you can't buy Hibernate because Red Hat's way bigger than Terracotta. And it's one of their crown jewels. Hibernate is something they never let go of. Uh, you can't buy Tomcat because it's Apache, so you just kind of support it. Everything else, EH Cache and Quartz, we bought. And we'll probably continue in that path. Finding things that you guys want to work with every day that are basically have reached some level of ubiquity or stand, you know, pseudo standard or de facto standard, and go acquire it and get it to work or partner with. So OpenJPA, Eclipse Lake, we're working on every ORM we can, we're, we're working with every CMS we can, we're working with Spring Source on all their frameworks, trying to get stuff to cluster, things like that. So what is the H cache? Basically, what I like to do at this point is sort of prove in pseudo-mathematics that you need a distributed cache, and that they exist not because of some scientific exercise on the part of people like me or Cameron Purdy or Billy Newport at IBM, but they exist out of necessity. <clears throat> and this is just a picture to help me walk you through my logic. So let's ignore the two JVMs on the right. There's just this guy on the left. That uh, has all these frameworks I mentioned, right? We've literally, I mean, Sun sort of wanted to buy EH Cash before we did, so did uh, several other companies. So Sun did a survey, actually they didn't want to buy the framework, they just wanted to sell support for it. Um, so they pulled their customer base, 13,000 or so customers, and found that 70% of them had EH cash in production. So they said this might be a worthwhile endeavor. And while they were doing that, we were in Thailand negotiating with the owners of the framework and signing contracts. So we kind of beat several companies to the punch. but. Um, these are the frameworks we think you guys use. You know, of course there's more than this, and of course this is an oversimplification, but all I'm saying is look at a Java application, it's got frameworks inside it. Those frameworks, one of them is the HCache, let's focus on that for a second, and just think of this box sitting here. So you start out, why is the HCache in your application? It's to reduce latency of expensive network calls to slower data sources. That was a lot of words, 
What is that? Database is slow. That's what it means. Web service calls, I don't care how much you work on inside the Java profile or tuning a particular web service, a network call over HTTP through SOAP or REST, whatever stack you're using to call that service, that's going to add many, many milliseconds to your page generation time. Right? So EH cache is meant to be an in-process cache, so it's performance play. Right? I, instead of making a call to a third party over TCP, I go to a local memory. The, the exact reason caching exists in computer science. The problem becomes that for better or worse, we've chosen to scale out. Right? We, we can either scale up the database to get more throughput underneath an application. We can scale up the application server. We can scale up both. But for the most part, we scale out. And so when we scale out, we cause ourselves a performance problem. What is that performance problem? Terracotta's got a name for it. We call it the end times problem. Does anyone know what the end times problem is? Or one over n problem? No one? Anyone want to guess? We have to access the end times of each of the applications. You've got to access the data end well, times. Well, if, you, if, you, if you're going to cache it, only there, then you're going to have to contact the network, whatever the um, source is, yeah. for each one of the, 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 those VMs. Right, so I'll repeat that, because that's exactly correct. So the end times <coughs> problem is that now I've got three copies of my app. I've got three EH cache boxes. So this smart lady here recognizes that each one of these EH caches has to warm up. It has to get its contents built up from hitting the database once or n times and then you know, it can serve from local memory from that point on. So the more app servers you've got, the more times you hit the database, because each one has to warm up. In other words, if your application hit the database once organically for one node, it would hit it n times for n nodes, or n times problem. That's the whole concept of the n times problem. So you've got caching to give you performance. You start scaling out, and you've got a performance bottleneck again. And so you say to yourself, I want the caches to be shared. I want whatever this guy caches to be available to those guys. And you realize another problem, which is, what if I do some kind of weird transactional semantic, where I read from the cache, because I only had one node when I started. I read from the cache, and based on what I read, I compute a write. Like, cache plus one equals what I write to the database. Well, if I do cache plus one on all these nodes, these two guys might be empty. And they might set, you know, this guy will go zero plus one is one. This guy will go zero plus one is one when it should have been two. Right? So caching actually breaks my application from a business perspective. It breaks the logic of the app. So I land upon a distributed cache. That's what happened to Tegasol. That's what happened to Terracotta. We see that opportunity in the market to take a multi node app circa 2000, 2002, 2003 timeframe and get it to scale. Make sense? So distributed caching is not, you know, I sit in so many conferences where people say, I don't need Terracotta, I'm aware of it, but I don't need it because I don't have a ginormous app. I only have two nodes or four nodes. I don't need Terracotta. Ter Terracotta is for two nodes, four nodes, ten nodes. Our average number of nodes across the thousand customers we've got to date is something like 2.77, right, per application, not per customer. But you guys get the idea. So EH Cache saw this, Terracotta saw this. EH Cache has distributed caching, right? It's not that Terracotta gives EH Cache distribution, because EH Cache had RMI. The problem is EH Cache tries to do a good job, but it's only a couple of guys in that team. Terracotta is a 20-person engineering team, right? Working at it for five years before we tackled the framework drop-in use case. We built a core, scalable, coherent system. So I was at Amazon earlier today, and I wanted to talk about EH cache as capabilities when Terracotta is not present in the context of the cap theorem. But I don't want to talk about cap theorem in front of Amazon. Did I say eBay? I meant Amazon. I don't know what I said. You said Amazon. But, OK. But I don't like talking about cap in front of Amazon. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, but here I'll do it. So. Um, Basically what we're saying in terms of CAP is EH cache prefers latency 
and throughput to consistency. Specifically, RMI is, is either, it's, it's very confusing because the documentation has synchronous replication for EH cache and asynchronous replication. So you think, great, I have a really mission critical set of data, I'm going to turn on synchronous replication, and that means if I, check, if I do a put to the cache in that first box, it'll put to all three boxes uh, and wait for the other two to acknowledge that the put occurred. But in concurrency, that's not good enough because the first box, you don't know what's happening amongst threads in those boxes. You only know that your thread that called a put has a block on it until that put is act by two other nodes, but you don't know if another guy is putting at the same time. There's no locking in EH cache, there's no waiting. It prefers throughput um, and latency to availability and correctness, consistency. Right. So in the cap theorem, it slides all the way to the loose guarantees side of the system and says, I'll do my best, but you really can't trust what's in these systems. <clears throat> so Terracotta's entire value problem, by the way, if you have questions, just raise your hand. I don't like you know, trying to answer questions where people are like, you know, 20 slides ago when you said that, I had a question. So just shoot your hand up and call out my name if I don't see it. So EH cache running with Terracotta, is its purpose just to improve the, the cap theorem guarantees or the coherency or the scalability? What is its purpose? Its purpose is multi-dimensional. First and foremost, it's to maintain the simplicity of the EH cache. So you've got EH cache in your app. I want to snap Terracotta in, as we say on our website. Just plug it in, no changes to the code. All the data in EH cache that you want in Terracotta will be stored in Terracotta. And what will that give you? It will give you a linear scale. I'll explain that in a second. It will give you a massive data sets. So EH cache can only handle what fits in RAM and a little bit of disk on that machine. Terracotta can handle terabytes of cache. We're actually working on uh, petabyte storage in our benchmarking team right now. <clears throat> seeing if we handle a petabyte and a billion cache entries, which there's a good chance we do right now, because uh, we've blasted through uh, terabyte at the beginning of the year. Um, so it's large scale data sets, it's linear scale out of that data, and it's high, high availability guarantees. That data is correct in the, every node that wants it, right? So, it's, it's about a totally different set of trade-offs in CAP. It's not saying, let me give you all throughput and all low latency. It's about, let me give you the best throughput, the best low latency I can without you having to understand the business ramifications of, the, of making correctness and consistency trade-offs. Because as um, my friend Brian Getz put it very eloquently at uh, QCOM down in San Francisco two years ago, eBay and Amazon are both in retail and e-commerce, but they have completely different consistency guarantees they, they must provide. If eBay did not get the highest auction price possible and you had a regular complaint droning on about, I bid higher than the winning bid, why didn't I win this, this product? Eventually eBay would lose its foothold on the auction marketplace. So it's got to be transactional, acid, everything that happens gets flushed to the system in the last you know, it can't be last one in win semantics, it can't be things like that. Amazon, if you sell one more, you know, stroller than you actually had, you can email someone later and say, sorry, I, I sold out of that thing, I'll get it back in a week. It's very different semantics. You can, you want to do your best in both businesses, but your best is very different. Your best in Amazon is lots of throughput, really slick shopping experience, and 99% high quality experience. And eBay is big sellers, right? It's maximize the dollars because you're a marketplace. And the point of that is to say that you need to be able to slide up and down that cap theorem and trade-offs. EH cash is just one side of the, the system. It's a very low consistency guarantee. Terracotta gives you a totally different world focused on availability and throughput at the same time. So let's dive into it. First of all, think of Terracotta like NFS, right? Um, if, 
you hate NFS, then don't think of it. <laughs> and most people hate NFS, but those are usually all guys, and you guys are all devs. So I'll stick with the analogy until someone tells me otherwise. But this is like the terracotta driver. This is a jar file. It's a core set of libraries inside our system that EH Cache ports, our Tomcat session manager, things like that. They rely on the feet, on the libraries inside this jar. So where we used to be a bytecode manipulator, we now have an explicit library to do cluster. And in this are services like lock and unlock a key, um, clustered map, clustered queue, so you could do first in, first out without JMS, and guaranteed delivery. There's a cyclic barrier, so you can make sure multiple threads on multiple JVMs get to the same point of code. So there's just a handful of tools, and this toolkit's really cool because you can use it to devolve a breakdown a use case into its constituent parts and build something by hand. So you're not stuck just getting the H cache reports from us, right? So this driver has all those low-level services. It's responsible for connecting into the array. It's got one socket into the array, and then it multiplexes and splits that socket up just like it were multiple sockets. So it's easy for an operator to manage this system. Then the terracotta array itself is a bunch, each of these white boxes, can you guys see this? This in the back. Each of the white boxes is a JVM, and preferably it's a JVM on its own box. Uh, so we get a lot of users of blade systems, like just filling, filling blades up with terracotta processes. So what happens is the first one you start up, he says, I am the only guy here, I have all the data responsibility. So I'm gonna keep the data on disk, transactionally case something's lost. In case I die and have to be restarted, I restart, right? Second guy to come up, they say, oh, there's only two of us. So the way our system works, you could do it differently, but we say, I'll be the master, you be the slave. I'll, you replicate everything I do in real time, shadowing me behind the clients. So when they ask for a key value pair, I'll answer. When they ask to mutate a key value pair, so a get comes from me, a put goes to both of us, right? And if I die, you take over. Answer and forget. So the clients are doing the put to both machines? Clients are not doing the put to both machines. They're doing the put to the master, and the master's doing the put to the slave. And the slave and the master are, it's bad nomenclature. It, it's, it's not true to call them active active, but they're both hot, they're both online, they're both doing all the transactions as shadows, so there's no replay or log apply on the start, on the takeover, it's instantaneous. When the, when the backup decides to take over, it's sub-second. It's down below a half a second. There's several more questions. Yes? You were talking to me about how you would use a, uh, a cache so that you didn't have to go across the network boundary to be able to get your data. But in this case, you're going across the network boundary to get the data. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great you're question. having to do serialization to serialization or something right. like that. I'm just curious what you have to say about that. Sure. I'll answer that later. <laughs> uh, it's a great question, but it's a, it's a very, very powerful question it's, it, in its simplicity. It takes a couple of minutes to answer. Yeah. Uh, the put to the master, does it do the put to the slave before it returns? Yeah, it does. Um, start up two more, and they'll say, let's split the data in half. Right, so the, they'll, that's why this picture looks like this. So if you start up enough terracotta, you've got stripes of terracotta going and mirrors. So we call it software RAID. So <laughs> internally to the system, we heartbeat inside here, and we decide to fail over. A combination of these guys and these guys decide to fail over. All that basically has to happen is if these guys can't reach A1, they just try A2. And if they can't reach A2, they try A1 again. And they just keep going round robin between the A's until one of the A's answers for them. The A's internally decide which one of them is the master and which one's alive based on voting in a quorum protocol. The A's and the B's don't really have to talk to each other. Same. So it's really share nothing, linear scale out strikes. So, so far we've established linear scale out and we've established high availability of the service itself, but not consistency or coherency of the data and we'll get there next. Yes? So 
A1 and A2 are on the same box or a different box? They should be different boxes. So what happens if you lose the link between them? If you lose the link between those, it uh, doesn't really matter because what will happen is, let's say A1 is master, A2 uh, will lose the link, get a, a network level event from our software, and cause an election. He'll say, I don't see a master in my slice. So he takes over as master, but all the clients can see A1. So it doesn't matter that he's alive because no one's talking to him because all the clients can still see the true master. When the network gets repaired between the two, because your our alert, our console tools will tell you they're both alive, uh, this guy will kill this guy. How will he kill him? He'll basically sit there and say, who has the clients? Who has the newest set of data, the most up-to-date transaction IDs? Who has the most objects? And the guy with the most clients and the most data kills the other guy automatically on recovery. There was a question back there. So who, who determines uh, when to bring up BNC? Who determines when to bring up BNC? External forces. A human or a scalability framework like uh, EC2 Autoscale inside uh, Elastic Load Balancer. Uh, we also ship a load balancer called HA Proxy, which is open source inside the kit. So if you're doing a web app with HTTP, you can get it to scale uh, on its own and start with more stripes. But generally, this is a strength of Terracotta. So your question is who determines when to scale? And I'm going to read into that question, which is always bad for a speaker to do. And there are a lot of frameworks out there that auto-scale. They'll just start spinning up more nodes, or if you just start up more processes, they'll redistribute data to other processes on the fly. These systems go down. They go down for the reason that they're automatic because automatic leads to emergent behaviors, which means weird timings occur. And one of the simplest examples, I, I met a customer, two customers here in the Seattle area. Both of them have the world's largest, like most popular in-memory data grid or extreme transaction platform. And both of them crash regularly. And so they are getting rid of them. Why did they crash regularly? Because every node you add causes a rebalance event to the existing grid. And so if you add two in quick succession, you create too much workload on the cluster that doesn't have CPU left over or JVM left over to do business workload, starts full GCing. You lose the first node and the, the oldest node in the cluster first, which causes the system to do another rebalance event to do HA for the missing data. And then that causes more workload on the cluster. So this emergent behaviors like makes it really hard to handle these autonomic or self-healing systems. And in fact, uh, one of our, our users' favorite features with us is that um, you can start and stop all these terracottas all you want, but to get them to actually be recognized by the pre-existing subset of the cluster that's running and has data in it, you have to send a JMX event and kick the system and wake it up and say, reread, config, let new members in. So it's very easy as an operator to say, let me double the size of the cluster, and then kick the cluster once, and then you double it, and then rebalance and go. Instead of every node creates a multicast election or brought, you know, some kind of broadcast where you discover you and automatically heal or grow or shrink or whatever. So the A's have their own load balance in front of them, so the customer doesn't have to know, or the consumer doesn't have to know um, that the, how many A's there are. Right? You, configure, you configure the consumer to say, no. point here, how do you do that? You configure the consumers over <laughs> HTTP. So there's an HTTP server sitting in each one of these. And they keep track of the comings and goings of array members. And then there's a JMX protocol to kick this driver and say reload the config. So it's very static. It's very point in time the number of members. There's no load balancer, no networking gear required. We will round robin through a list of IPs. And you can add to that list or remove from that list by uh, changing the config.xml, then asking for a reload. Is there a big startup on this? I mean, we kind of talked about the, the hot deployment kind of stuff, but you go out and if you want to have a three or a something like that, there's a wait time to everything up or it just doesn't put, it doesn't make, a3 available until it's available. 
Yeah, so A3, if you added an A3 in this strike group, it would not be, uh, it would start up immediately, but then begin imaging from the existing members. The least loaded member of the strike group would give it all the existing data onto its disks from their disks in the transactional fashion, so it would catch up. So depending on your data set, it's between half a second for small data sets and 50 minutes. I've seen worst case, you know, almost an hour to bring a new member into a group. And the answer to shrink the new membership time is add more stripes so there's less data per strike. Does, is that a one-time decision as to which is the least loaded or is it reevaluated? No, it's it when the member joins, who's going to image. Okay, so at that moment, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So we covered HA of the array itself, and we've covered scalability of the array itself. We haven't covered throughput, which goes back to the lady in front's question. You've got a hop, just like you said, EH cache is supposed to eliminate. You know, what's the game here? And the answer is it's a two tier coherency protocol, which we made up, which means it's something we made up. You're all looking at me here. <laughs> two tier coherency means if I want to get if I select a row from the database over JDBC and get a result set back into memory, right? That row is, it's over, right? The database has let it go out the network. It doesn't have any way to tell me and that data's changed while you're reading it or things like that, right? I can do select for update and that tells the database hold on to a lock on this row, uh, read lock on this row. That's a one tier coherency protocol. I go back to the source and tell it what I want to do to the data tell it my intentions on the data and it tells me you have been granted the right to do that operation that you intended to do. And I will deal with your commit or rollback, etc. A two-tier coherency protocol is where these guys report back what's in memory here. And then these guys allow, these guys are the broker of whether to trust what's here or whether something here is newer, fresher, better. And that means that uh, the name of the game is to let EH cache do its thing and read locally. Always let it read locally if you can. But you can't always do that because you could have objects from the A group and he could have them at the same time and he could be writing them while you're writing them. So what happens is if you do a get on A, that pulls it locally. He does a get on A, that pulls it locally also. Now the array knows both of you have access to the data. You're both allowed to read it because no one's writing it. As soon as someone goes to write it, depending on the level of coherency you've asked for, you can block him from reading it, you can block him, or you can let him continue to read it. And it's really easy to do. So you just do a get, and um, then you want to do a put. So that put you do will go here, and when he tries to do another get, he'll get pushed, the data, because he has A. He won't be told about changes to A because he doesn't have it. So that's why the array, even though it represents a network hop, can outrun other systems that represent a network hop because it's throughput optimized, it's taking advantage of the two tiers. It, there's a demand, there's a contract between these two where he says, these are the subset of data I'm using. And this is how they're being used at this moment by threads. That's reported back here. And then this guy in turn is saying, well, you want to use this data, anyone else changing it, I'm going to push it at you as if you had gotten a subscription to it, right? So RSS is pull, right? If I want to read data, I pull it. Terracotta is push. I do a pull the first time, I do a get, and from that point on, everything I need is pushed at me. And the Terracotta array, being a single point of uh, expertise about what's being used where, is figuring out patterns statistical patterns in the data access. So we figure out that A's and B's always get used together. So when you ask for A, we push you B with A. And then we figure out that, let's say you have a load balancer up here. And then you said A's here, B's here, C's here. There's no way for this guy to get at A's for some reason. In this case, physically it happens to be there's a load balancer keeping A's off of him, right? Only requests for B go to him. So, the array notices that he has no A's, and he only has B's, and no one else has B's, which means he's given the B's, and he's given access to the B's without having to come back to the array to ask permission. So he says, I want to edit a B, and the array says, go ahead, stop asking me. 
I'll tell you, if anyone else ever has the ability to access it, then I'll tell you to yield back to me. And so that two-tier coherency protocol allows me to say, you know what, you're in charge of these for now, even though you're an application node. Or I've got to keep these centralized because they're in high contention across the cluster. And so you have a system that's simultaneously optimizing for throughput on all the different access patterns being presented to it in your application. Could you walk through that? You had used your early example of, of the community problem was the zero plus one, mm -hmm. right? I, they both have zero. Could you walk through what happens? Yeah. So they simultaneously, they both go zero plus one. Yeah. How does that all get resolved? So yeah, these two. guys want to do whatever's in the cache plus plus. Simple yeah. coherency challenge, right? Yeah. So this guy goes first. He says, get A. A's at zero. He goes A plus plus. A's now at one. This guy goes, get A. His local driver says, you've never seen A. Pull it from the array. In the array, it's at one because this guy wrote, which means his right had to be four. Well, let's case the case so that it's simultaneous, right? They both, they both read A yeah. as zero. It's, and at the exact same so instance. So what people don't get about Terracotta when I explain it is it's pessimistic. That means there is no concurrency race because in order to write to A, he had to lock A. Oh, okay, so there's a lock. Okay, there's a key. lock okay. inside the threading system in the JVM. Okay. In EH cache, it's built in. Okay. You do a get, I get a lock. Okay. And then I check, is this up to date or do I have to pull? So the first time he goes to get it, he can't get it out. Now, in EH cache by default, it's interesting because it's throughput optimized, right? So even when Terracotta's present, he'll do a get, he'll get zero. He'll do a get, he'll also get zero. Then he'll do a put, he'll put one. He'll do a put, he'll put one. So if you want to fix that, there's a, a module in EH cache called explicit locking which means I don't want my lock boundary to be during the get, the duration of the get. I want it to be from get till put, select for update. So I do explicit lock dot lock A. A dot get, that returns me zero. Now he can't get me. So that's why all the modules, I, I promised I was gonna explain the, the structures in the H cache. One of the core reasons is you don't need it, certain things until you need them, and the community has figured that out together over the past seven years. So explicit locking is something that, I don't know, 50% of apps, if I were to pull a number out of the air, don't need to do. You, you've had a cache all along, and it's been multi-threaded in your applications. You, you all use the edge cache. Do you do a synchronizer on some object before you do a get, and then hold that synchronizer until you do a put? Chances are you don't, right? So the get of the EH cache object you're getting, that's a Java object today in a single JVM case. Do you hold the lock on it while you mutate it? Chances are you don't, right? Because you didn't realize that if you do a get on two threads, both of them are reading and writing the same memory. Will the JVM blow up? No, it won't, depending on the mutation you do. If the, if the element you've stored in the EH cache is a let's say some kind of concurrent safe, unsafe data structure, it might blow up. But for the most part, you're not doing get, lock, mutate, put, or lock something else in the sky, and then doing get, put, unlock, right? So most of you don't want that burden. You just want to know that EH cache in the cluster is the same as EH cache in the VM, and that's what it is, but it's got modules to add. So I haven't used EH cache, but all the caching I've done when I, I use optimistic locking in the database, I just, when I write it, I just invalidate the cache. Mm -hmm. So the next read is reading in the latest thing. And, but the fallback is always, when you go to do the update, it fails mm -hmm. the database. So that'll, that'll work with the cache too. There's nothing different about the cache. But, so the question is, is, is there anything in EH cache and this infrastructure that, that has a built-in uh, object versioning so that I can use optimistic locking uh, optimistic in the cache. Optimistic locking is built into Hibernate, for example. Yes. So if you use Hibernate on top of the H cache on top of Terracotta, you've got optimistic locking. If you don't want to use Hibernate and you want to use caching directly, uh, it's versioning built into EH cache, a simple hint that's being kept track of every time you do a put, it increments transparently. And that I can get to? You can get to it as part of the element, element.version. Okay. Oh, thank you. The um, array that you've got down at the bottom is that is that JVMs in memory or are they 
JVMs in memory, um, they, they each write to disk. They each write to commodity local disk. We had a customer in Texas put our array onto an EMC SAN. Don't do that. Because then the EMC becomes a single point of bottleneck and a single point of failure. And you got to call your disk storage admin to get your spindles optimized. Terracotta is like a network attached storage, right? Because I'm getting six disks worth of throughput in this picture. Why would I want those six disks funneled through a fiber channel onto one SAN for a storage guy to fan back out <laughs> to six disks? <laughs> so um, the record, the record this is a share nothing. Should be a machine per little <coughs> instance. And each one of these white boxes is a JVM, and it's writing to disk. And you want to write to, you can turn off the disk. Or? Sorry. Does that ever get back to a database, or is that just the database? There's a pattern for getting back to a database in EH cache called right behind standard caching stuff. So you can register a callback to get puts and updates back to a database. And removes. <coughs> Well, uh, <laughs> let's park the questions for a second. Let me push forward a little bit more in the interest of time. Let's see if I answer some of your questions along the way. So we added um, acidity. Terracotta's got the two-tier coherency protocol. If you want to read something that he's writing, you're not going to read it till after he writes it. Um, it's got no single point of failure, which EH Cash had, by the way, because EH Cash copied everything to every node. Uh, so it was space inefficient. Terracotta has only what you need is what you've got. Uh, you can get access to anything, but then internally, in our central store, our central store is really a distributed store, internally. Right? We were just sitting in an offsite last Friday, and Greg Luck, the founder of BH Cash, and I, and our head of product management, Mike Gallen, were looking at all the NoSQL stores, looking at their definitions in this new paper that just came out. There's not a single thing different about them than Terracotta, but Terracotta's not included in the NoSQL store analysis. No idea why. It's got replication, it's got key value store, it's got you know some sort of query, it's got HA, it's got scale, it's got everything. <coughs> and then, you know, it can do multi-language, we're getting better at it now. I'm gonna skip through all this. So let's look at EH cache with Terracotta, because this is where it gets powerful. We've got this config file that's standard EH cache. Several of you have used EH cache. If you haven't, don't get wrapped around the axle. EHcache.org will walk you through everything in detail, right? But there's a default cache, which means any cache that doesn't have settings, specific settings, will inherit those settings from the default. Um, and then here's where I like to explain something. I need to add this to the deck because I sometimes forget to explain it. But the concept in EH cache that makes it uh, stronger than the competitors is how it's factored. So you think of EH cache and you're like, okay, it's a fancy map, right? What is this thing? It's a get and put. I could do this with a hash map, right? First and foremost, a cache isn't a cache unless you want to evict stuff. If you don't want to evict stuff, then you probably should use a simpler data structure like a map. Eviction is a very hard problem to get to scale and not with application access to the cache uh, and not run out of memory. Um, you know, if you do eviction by saying, let me just on a put, if I'm out of space, clear clean up space, you'll umi all the time. So you've got to actually run threads doing eviction. You've got to know what to evict without iterating across the entire cache. So eviction is the difference between a cache and a map. But each cache takes it one step further. It actually puts decorators in front of the cache and listeners behind the cache. This is a very powerful concept, and I'll prove that with two just simple examples. The first was uh, we had a customer prospect who Greg Luck went to meet. They said, I'm using Hibernate with EH cache. It's useless. It's not helping me at all. Right? And he looked at it, and it turned out they had a, a serious dependency on the query cache. And so, Show of hands who knows what query caching is in Hibernate. So over half the room. So very quickly for the other half of the room, it's basically you access stuff by primary key that goes into the entity caches in the second level cache. If you access large groups of things by having some kind of query predicate that returns multiple primary key data, 
the list of primary keys returned in that query goes into the query cache. So it's a vector into the entities. And so like you say, select star where zip code equals 90210, and every customer who's in that zip code will be in that list. The problem with the query cache is change any customer, and that uh, query cache is invalidated, the whole cache. Because you don't, hibernate's not Oracle. It doesn't know what's in and what's out of any query. So they took the easy route, which is the smart route, and invalidate. So anyway, this customer said, I want caching. How do I get it to work? So a listener in EHCache is a callback after the event. So I'm going to go put something into the cache. You can register something that as part of the put, I will fire. A decorator is a proxy to the cache. Before I'm called, you're called. And you can decide what to do with it. So stack those two together and you can create, just like Tomcat or Servlet spec has filter chains, we've got decorator chains and listener chains. So you can pass from decorator to decorator to decorator doing all kinds of stuff. So what we did for this user, and they got so excited about this power, was to basically say, register a standard EH cache under Hibernate. It's plugin, just said second level cache provider equals net SF EH cache Hibernate second level cache provider. Second level caching equals true, right? Done. Now turn on a listener inside this cache config. Just set the cache name for those entities and turn on a listener. That listener will let you know when primary key data is being changed in the cache. When Hibernate wants to put or get, your code gets called back. So now you've got eyes and ears inside Hibernate. Now, the other part of the pattern is you do a, a Hibernate session, execute a prepared statement inside it, get back the result set, turn that into a set of objects and just store those in an EH cache in the sky as a POJO cache, forget the Hibernate query cache. Now you've got a cache and you've got the ability to hear when Hibernate's changing primary keys. So you write the glue that says, with this change, these caches change, need to be evicted or eliminated, etc. Right? So we actually, with EH cache, which is standard, shipped with Hibernate give you the ability to see what's happening inside Hibernate because of the notion of a listener. The second problem was for card services in Australia. They had a Sydney data center and a Melbourne data center. And when they write to this cache, it's in place of a database. EH cache plus Terracotta is the database for this set of data. So they can't lose it. They want to write it across both data centers, but they want to read from the local data center. So you create two caches, one called Melbourne, one called Sydney. And then you pass a dash D property of which data center a JVM is in. When you start up the JVM, you say dash D, you know, com dot my company dot data center ID equals Sydney. And then what you do is you say EH cache, two caches, Sydney and Melbourne. I'm going to put a decorator in front that all the code gets to. And through that decorator, I'm going to say based on the dash D, if you do a get, I'm going to get from the named cache underneath the wrapper cache. You guys get it? And if you do a put, I have JTA inside each cache. So someone asked about distributed transactions at the beginning, and I said I'll cover it. There's JTA provider built by Terracotta, provided in open source. So each cache standalone is JTA. Each cache on top of Terracotta is JTA capable. So we basically write to Sydney and we write to Melbourne in a data in a JTA transaction. So both data centers act or we roll back. So now you're writing to two data centers synchronously, but reading locally, even if the WAN link is severed between them, without a complex dependency on some black magic third party WAN product from Terracotta. You're just using EH cache, stacking a decorator in front for read and another decorator with JTA for write. So that decorator listener pattern, that's a differentiator versus the Editors, right? You mentioned them by name, so I, you mentioned Gigaspaces, you mentioned IBM. These guys go bottom up. They make you understand their thinking. So they have a set of customers who have shown them a set of problems to date, and they say, I can solve that problem. Here's a framework for it. Here's an interface for it. Here's an API. You want Gigaspaces on the WAN, here's Gigaspaces WAN libraries. With Terracotta and EH Cache, the answer is not here's EH Cache for when. The answer is we've got decorators, listeners, we stack the stuff together. We've got 
the HA of the terracotta array, we've got the scale of the terracotta array, we've got the persistence of the terracotta array. We stack all of these things together and literally WAN replication in EH cache goes in this XML file. So you still do get, you still do put, you still do EH cache, but you don't do it, um, you don't do a different EH cache for this use case versus that use case. It's just a cache. Yes? Uh, on that uh, <coughs> split brain uh, personality, let's say we have a uh, synchronous put, right? Uh, there is a network problem, so we can link put. So it's my understanding that your solution will stop, so the application has to be coded so it cannot do puts. But in case of gigaspaces, for example, they provide a synchronous replication. <coughs> So the question was, with Terracotta, do you have the replication <coughs> synchronous between the mirror groups? And so when the replication cannot happen, then the application is just paused. Whereas in Gigaspaces, for example, there's asynchronous replication configurable within the servers themselves. So that the application can write to one, and then the one will keep a job of getting to the other one later. So I'll answer the question straightforwardly which is to say, given the way you answered the question, it's not correct. So when Terracotta does not have two members of the mirror group, the remaining, the surviving member will queue on behalf of the other ones and will catch them up when they come back. So, but I said I'd answer straightforward because it is when you lose the entire mirror group, then we do block. So whether you talk to a data space a salesperson or not doesn't really matter. There are cases when Terracotta can block the application. And why is that? Because it's a two-tier coherency protocol. You need both tiers working together to be able to tell if it's safe to read or if that write has been stored. So how do you get around that two-tier coherency protocol? It's the, I think I've got it here, non-stop cache. So the first aspect of the answer to your question is if part of the mirror group is unhealthy, think of it like RAID. Have you guys, have you played with uh, RAID storage devices on your desktop or in the data center context? No? So RAID has green, red, or amber situations, right? Which means I need at least two or three disks, depending on the type of RAID you've got, to be able to establish an array if all the members of the array are healthy and all the data is consistent and every operation is working healthy, that's green. If I've, lost, if I've lost a disk and every operation you do is at risk of being lost if you don't fix this array soon, that's amber. And I've lost too many disks, I can no longer allow writes, I must block them, that's red. Terracotta is identical to that is what I'm saying. As, as long as part of a mirror group is alive, the mirror group is alive. <coughs> If you lose the whole mirror group, you can't write to it anymore, obviously, or somewhat obviously. But when you lose the whole mirror group, that's when non-stop cache comes in. Non-stop cache lets you as a developer, it's a more EH cache decorators and listeners. It's what do I do when I want all my writes, all my puts, and all my gets to have timers on them. So I do a get, and then the decorator does a get with a timer. So inside that EH cache.xml, I said, non-stop cache equals true for a particular cache, and then I set timeout for that cache. I don't want to wait more than five milliseconds for any operation, get or put or update or remove, right? And so how do I, what do I do when that five milliseconds triggers, fires off? That's all what the non-stop cache is all about. Option one, just ignore the error and move on. Depending on the use case, that makes sense. Hibernate second level cache, I don't care if I can't write to the cache. I still have the database to fall back on, right? EH cache as a system of record, I want an exception. I may want to time out and not be blocked as the gentleman in the back asked. But when I get the timeout, I don't want to drop the transaction on the floor. I want an exception that I get to handle in my code. So that's the nonstop caches. Pretend like nothing happened, uh, move on, and then that's on the right. On the read path, you can also say, read the local memory that was last put there by the terracotta array, or don't trust the local memory, say the cache is empty. 
So you actually have the control over how consistent you are when you partition and how available you are on your rights when you partition. There was a question popped up back there. Okay, so I guess you probably ought to ask it then. So if, uh, if we have that non-stop cache on the right, presumably in the data in the local cache, there must be a um, Depends on you set what you want. So if you set the cache to fail silently, then a put to a non-stop cache that's broken, because the mirror group is broken that it needs to write to, will not occur. So you will not write to this cache when it cannot get to the terracotta array underneath. The question is, what do you do when you fail to write? Do you fail silently or throw an exception back? And that's all in the hcache.exe. Right fails, you also stop that's again, a, do you, you decide the on write, do I throw an exception or fail silently? On read, do I throw an exception or trust local memory or fail silently? So you can trust the local memory if your use case is one where like reference data, zip code tables, is this zip code in this county, in this state? You know, if I miss the update that happens once a quarter when I find new zip code data or new tax data, just keep reading it for goodness sake, right? But if it's a bank account ba balance and a debit or a credit, then I kind of want an exception. And I don't want to read the local data, nor do I want to write the local data. All of those permutations and combinations are there. And this is the, the second thing that's powerful about EHCache. So we talked about decorators and listeners, and you all got that. What we haven't talked about is each cache is discreetly configurable. So to put a cache into terracotta, terracotta clustered equals true. RMI replication is a listener, right? That's all it is, is on event. Send an RMI event to other nodes. RMI replication can be placed on the cache. If you place conflicting configs like RMI and terracotta, you're gonna cause feedback loops, will blow up in parsing that config. Of course, we haven't thought of any free permutation and combination with listeners and decorators, but I could make one cache terracotta cluster. I could make one cache not terracotta cluster. I could make a cache non-stop. I could make another cache blocking, as the gentleman in the ask that in the back asked, is it going to block if the terracotta array? Right? Sorry, that was a weird slip. <laughs> the ask that. It's been a long day. You guys get the idea, right? So each cache was good. But it was really simple and powerful. Terracotta makes EHCache what we call enterprise class. You know, durable data, uh, scale on the fly, no limitations of what a single JVM can handle, uh, mirror, you know, windowing onto data, getting a terabyte into a 32 bit VM by pulling in only the pieces and parts you need when you need them, all that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to go through all these features, but we talked about JTA. So at the beginning, someone asked distributed transactions. The answer is two, two dimension. There's a two-tier coherency protocol, right? That means that maybe I don't need transactions. If I'm not updating another system of record in addition to the cache, it is internally safe, right? I will not lose data just by putting it. I'm guaranteed no one else will see, will lose that put. Because if someone is in a state where they can't get the data that I've put into the cache, they'll be quarantined out of the cluster before they read stale data. How do we do that? I didn't explain. But um, simple answer is there, built into our connection is heart beating. So we know if we're alive. We know if our mirror groups are alive. We know if you're alive. We're heart beating in all directions, looking for hunting for network partitions and hunting for down servers and even hunting for servers in the middle of a GC. We figured out that if a JPM is GCing, believe it or not, you can still connect to it. So we have a socket inside our driver sitting there waiting for TCP connections. Because TCP connection handshake is done by the OS, not by the JVM. So a fully paused JVM will still allow a connected socket in. So we're sitting there heart beating, we're probing JVMs, and we're classifying JVMs as up and fast, slow, down, and uh, paused in GCing or down. We know all those granular levels of networking events. 
and it's all built into our system. So literally, if you just want distributed safe data, Terracotta underneath EH Cache should do it. If you want to update two caches at once, like card services in Australia, you want to distribute a transaction across two puts. That's JTA. We've got right behind to the question in the front, can I do a, you know, optimistic concurrency? Well, right behind is sort of the opposite of optimistic concurrency. It is the cache is the system of record and the database is catching up at some point in the future. To do um, read-through and validation or optimistic concurrency without hibernate, you use the versioning on the cache itself. Bulk loading is a problem we ran into because our system is so acid and so safe that it's very slow if you want to spin through and load stuff as fast as you can because you'll be yielding to other VMs who might be doing the same. So the bulk load API is an extension to EH cache. It's a module that allows you to shift the cache into an incoherent gear, which means I'm just going to ask the local Terracotta driver to prepare all of these operations against the cache and uh, create big chunks of network packets with thousands of updates each and then flush them all in one fell swoop and then switch back into coherent mode as a normal member of the cluster. So I can load millions of entries in a couple of seconds. Uh, cap configurability, we brought it up. EH cache is on one extreme. Terracotta can go all the way to the other extreme, getting data to disk before it yields an application to continue on. And with Terracotta and EH cache non-stop mode, uh, there's an unlocked reads view listed right there. You could say, I want all my writers to write in a coherent fashion, but I want my readers to always read what's local, even if Terracotta hasn't pushed an update yet, don't wait. Don't ask Terracotta, is this data up to date? Right. So if we dissect everything I've been saying for the last several minutes, uh, hopefully I've come to an answer as to why Terracotta can outrun standard network uh, you know, external data sources across the network. It knows more than those other data sources about your intent. It can skip a network call. Uh, it's got the data in application native format, so it's cheaper to move it on the network because it's in application native format, so the marshal on marshal is different from a SQL one. But at the end of the day, it's because it, it's guessing what you need before you need it, and it's uh, giving you the ability to slide up and down the scale in one set of APIs. Let me read whatever's local. I just want this EH cache to be in unlocked reads mode, which I do in XML. That means my gets are lightning fast. They're always local. And then I could switch that EH cache into coherent mode in, at runtime if I wanted to. So it's more flexibility as well as the main answer there. Um, monitoring tools, I'm not going to demo them. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. But uh, all of this is open source. So you can go to Terracotta, download, uh, and get the whole thing going. This is our console. Um, it's impossible to see. Terracotta will show you everything that's going on inside the cluster. It'll show you what's in the heap of every machine. It'll show you the CPU, the network, the disk utilization on each node. It'll show you the aggregates, wherever those make sense. It'll show you how much data is moving backwards and forwards on the network between nodes, things like that. It'll show you how many members are in the array right now and whether they're up and healthy and green, as I said earlier, or red or some color in between. But these panels are something we're very proud of. It's when we stopped trying to be a core platform and being transparent, we stopped trying to, needing to show people what the threads in their JVMs are doing and instead we show them what their frameworks are doing. So these panels you're looking at, this big green bar, basically means there's an EH cache under a hibernate somewhere showing you that it's mostly hits. Green, big green bars means I'm hitting the cache, I'm skipping the database. Big red bars means I'm wasting time because I'm checking the cache and hitting the database anyway, and I'm missing the cache. Blue means I'm writing to the cache. That's why it's not yellow or some other color, because it's not necessarily that or good, we don't know, right? Is all this data exposed via JMX? This is a swing app, making JMX calls into the array. You can just connect to any member of the array, and it'll respond to you on behalf of all members. Could you spend some more time on the, um, the uh, 
no sequel stand in with, with, with uh, EH Cash and Terracotta. Because and, it's sort of like, well, EH Cash seems like specifically it's going to drop things out of the cash. It's cash. Mm -hmm. But Terracotta doesn't. So how do you? Uh, both do. If you set up eviction in EH Cash, it will drop things. If you disable eviction, it won't. But the cash itself has to evict things. Yeah. To, or else it run out of memory. That's right. I'll explain. Sure, okay. I can do that. So the question was, spend more time on NoSQL. This is one thing I want to, I always make sure to explain to people at Jugs. So everyone in this room had EH cash. This, if you take away one thing tonight and it's not, let's go download Terracotta and try the combination of the two together since I'm already using EH cash, fine. But this is the EH cash monitor. It just came out. It's uh, 1.0 GA and it's free for development. It's a production monitor. It will give you insight into what's in your caches. Um, and free for development means you can download it, plug it in, use it as much as you want in your developer workstation. But your ops guys, if they actually want to keep it running 24 7 and build managed monitoring and alerts off of it, they need to pay us. It's a one flat fee per year, like 10K a year, which sounds like a lot until you think about if it finds one problem faster than your devs would find it. And each year if it finds one problem faster than the devs would have found it without it. So it's full of graphs. It'll tell you this cache is set to have a maximum of 10,000 elements and it's bumping up to its max size all the time. And it'll let you change the size of that cache on the fly and give it more space in the JVM. It'll also estimate the size of caches using the Google memory um, library of, uh, uh, that Google gives away for free. So it'll tell you how many eggs a cache is using. It lets you search for cache entries, evict them manually, delete cache entries from the cluster, cluster-wide operations, even if you're not using Terracotta, because it's got a central monitoring server or management server that you deploy, and then a probe sitting in each of your EH cache clients. And it works, again, without Terracotta. And it'll just, all it's doing is uh, you know, multi-node JMX calls. It's, it's fanning out JMX operations to the cluster. And uh, the most important thing to take away is if you're using Hibernate and EH Cache, I'd go home, plug this in immediately. Because we found in the first six months of beta that 50% of our, of our users we talked to had EH Cache on under Hibernate and had no entities as cache. And so just plugging the monitor in showed them that the caches were all empty. No caches were created because the entity caches are created when a cacheable entity gets instantiated and loaded. So no caches were in the system. And they're sitting there saying, yeah, I plugged in Hibernate two year, uh, EH cache into Hibernate two years ago. Didn't seem to help too much. <laughs> right? And for years we've been sitting there saying, wow, we've got to make Terracotta super fast. We've got to make EH cache easier to use. How do we do that? And then we built the monitor and then the answer popped its head up. There's they forgot to set cacheable equals true for all their entities that made sense to cache. <laughs> so um, last uh, topic is performance. And then I'll open up for questions that haven't been asked. <coughs> so we did a detailed performance study. Um, what we did is we took Spring Pet Clinic and uh, we tore out most of the web app because we don't really need to benchmark the whole stack, right? We just want to focus on the distributed cache and compare Terracotta to all these things you listed, as well as JBoss, Memcache, and anything else anyone could do and see where we stand in the market. We need to know this for ourselves, right? Are we blowing smoke if we claim we're fast? But if someone downloads something else for free that outruns us, are we really solving the problem? Because again, the problem was the H cache gave me performance, Terracotta is supposed to give you scale. Add the nodes and get rid of the end times problem. And does it do that? And does it do it fast enough, right? And in fact, what we learned when we started this exercise two years ago is it wasn't fast enough. That we got rid of the end times problem, meaning that the database saw no incremental load by the addition of JVMs. But the JVMs saw additional latency by the two-tier coherency protocols introduction that slowed down. Right? And so you got, you basically paid, stole from Peter to pay Paul, essentially. You saw no load to the database, but you saw high load on Terracotta and higher latency in the app, and you needed more nodes, and it was a cascading problem. So 
we tuned and tuned and tuned, and then we wanted to get to a place where our benchmark was JBoss Cache. So JBoss Cache, they stopped building, so I guess I can disparage it now. But uh, it's built on top of JGroups. And JGroups is famous because it's got something like 1,744 different properties that need to be set to get it to go right. <laughs> and Bella Bond knows how to do it, and a select few people know how to do it. But the short answer is never run it in replicated mode, just run it in global and val broadcast and validation mode, a couple of other tricks, etc. Point is, Terracotta, we wanted no, what we called no knobs, no switches. We wanted it to work out of the box. So we took the Spring Pet Clinic, used the domain model, which is vets, pets, owners. Each owner had two pets in our load generation script. And uh, in a read-only test, you just kept looking up the owners, looking up their pets, and each pet had two vet appointments or four vet appointments. You kept looking up the appointments over and over again after you <coughs> generated all this data in a, gener you know, a data generation bulk load and then just pound on the system. Then there was a read-write, which was add new pets once a year per owner. They get a new pet, and another pet randomly will die somewhere in the system, and then Add vet appointments. Yeah, it's, it's a disturbing system. <laughs> and then we did a 50 50 read write mix as well. So, um, EH Cache and Terracotta is all we focused on. We really didn't, we, of course, before we owned EH Cache, we tested it and found it way faster than EH Cache with Terracotta, which was no good, so we bought it. But um, at this point, EH Cache with Terracotta is faster than EH Cache with RMIs. So, we've gotten rid of it the cost of Terracotta. We took eight JVMs, 64-bit uh, Red Hat, Dell, four core machines, two gigs of RAM each, 1.7 gig heat, um, ran Terracotta with replication on, and then turned it off to see if it was costing, what it was costing to run mirror groups in Terracotta. It was costing literally zero, because it's asynchronous in the back end, as I answered earlier, so why bother? It's asynchronous with the application. Uh, so why bother running it? Saves us some hardware. Terracotta servers had six gig, 64-bit heaps, and MySQL was run on the exact same. Everything was on the same class of machine. So arguably, you wouldn't penalize MySQL as hard as we did. <coughs> then we ran an in-memory data grid, uh, and for this guy and this guy, we paid third-party consultants to come in and tune them as best they could. The only rule they had is you can't rewrite the app. Right, which they desperately wanted to do to get it to go faster. So this data is very old. I'm beating up our benchmarking team. What this says is with a very small data set that fits in RAM, EH cache, and Terracotta flock, and everyone slows down as the data set gets too big to fit in a single 32-bit 1.7 gig heap, they start paging in and out data. So you can see the overhead of our networking protocols and our two-tier, in, in the case of the in-memory data grid, what is the cost of you know, not being able to cache everything locally and actually having to go out to the grid to fetch here with Terracotta going out to the array to fetch. MySQL, it's just always the disk, right, untuned. So what we found is the in-memory data grids have fixed latency. If it fits in memory or doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? There is something in, in this data grid called a near cache, which when you turn it on, uh, speeds it up tremendously as long as you're not writing to the data. If you write to the data, the near cache is useless. But when it, when the near cache is off, the data grids are showing you that they're always talking to the network to go fetch data remotely, and they're very slow, right? But they they just keep scaling. In fact, we took this out to something like three million key value pairs, and it just same latency. They're slow, but they don't slow down as the data set grows. Yes, I, I really don't understand this graph. What are the axes on this? This is TPS, and this is amount of data. So throughput as the amount of data grows for a read-only payload. So when the data is so small that it fits in 1.7 gigs, all of us are very fast, except for the data grid, unless you turn on your cache. When the data set gets larger, we all slow down. But the latest data on Terracotta and EH cache is this is about 350,000 today because we de-bottlenecked several subsystems inside our software. 
Uh, so we could do about 350,000 TPS under Hibernate just asking for entities over and over and over again. Vets, pets, owners, just keep asking for them. When it fits in RAM, we're very fast. When it doesn't fit in RAM, we fix that too. We're closer to about 160,000 TPS for large data sets. And uh, we have something in beta right now that's actually taking us linear as the data sets grow. So can you explain why, why my, my SQL line is linear then? Why shouldn't that have the same access? I mean, it should keep it in memory as well, right? And then go to disk when it can't. It's just too small to see. To see oh, it's declining. relative to the others. It it's declining, but you just can't see it in the graph. Yeah, okay. gotcha. it is declining. So, okay. uh, and that's the trick to fixing my SQL is give it a giant cache, right. disk cache. And once it can fit more and more memory, uh, more and more table data in memory, then it will uh, give you more and more throughput as well. But the interesting thing is this fits in memory in its file buffers inside MySQL. It's still slow. So it is more expensive to pop SQL, to go Java, to a SQL driver connection, to a SQL call, uh, convert rows into objects, and, and then return a, a reference is way slower than the data grids, which just return Java reference as serialized, deserialized. But EH cache is beating them all because of the two tiers. It's reading at a microsecond when it can trust local memory, which in this case it can always trust local memory, which is how we got to 350,000 TPS. In this case, it can always trust local memory because it's read only, but it doesn't all fit the RAM. It has to talk to Terracotta once in a while. But Terracotta is statistically computing and prefetching and pushing chunks of data to minimize network hops and is still outrunning everyone else. And I can prove that actually because this horrible line here is terracotta on EH cache right after we bought it. So without any optimizations to EH cache, this is what transparent clustering was able to do. Not a good job. And then the right graphs, everyone slows down. We've got these up in order of magnitude too. So we're up at 35,000 TPS when we're doing 90, 10 rewrite mix. And the database is now much, much faster relative to everyone else when you're writing, because databases are log forward, and not all of these caches are log forward. But we would now dwarf everyone in this graph, which is why I keep screaming at my benchmarking team to redraw it all. Yeah? A question about the benchmarking. Uh, for example, the in-memory uh, data grid returns the copy of the data. So if I get the copy and start changing that, Nobody's business, it's my copy. Uh, if I understand correctly, this EH cache and Terracotta, once I get the copy from the cache and start changing the attributes of the object, then if some other thread also got that, they will see that. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. I must have uh, explained something to you in a confusing manner earlier. So the question was, in the data grids, if I do a get and another get, I have two separate copies that cannot see each other and cannot slow each other down. In Terracotta and EH cache, when I do a get and another get, they can see each other. And the answer is EH cache and Terracotta is now the same as data grids, which means that you can turn this off, but by default, we, so let me explain it in empirical terms. I do a get, uh, I'm on JVM1. I do a get from the cache. It returns me an object from the network because I've never gotten object A before, right? So object A gets deserialized for me and then cached locally in deserialized form, be it terracotta or coherence or gigaspaces or any other data grid. It's cached locally deserialized. And so when I give you a, a uh, reference to it, you're getting the object, not a copy of it. You're, uh, if you do a second get on the same JVM for A, those two threads are talking to the same object. And when they serialize, they could be serializing each other's changes. In EH cache, you could say copy on read equals true inside ehcache.xml, and that means everyone gets a deserialized copy and no local caching is occurring so that there's no concurrency risks in my particular application. Um, the, so the other aspect of this is that um, when I do a get and I'm on JVM1 and you do a get for A and you're on JVM2, we did get two copies because our 
local to JVM deserialized cache is not shared, be it Terracotta or any other data grid. And so you and I across JVMs are thread safe because we're working with copies, but two threads in the same JVM without copy on read equals false or equals true are not thread safe. So by default, all caches are the same. I do get, and then I have data, and then I do put, right? Uh, in a distributed cache, typically, they are unlocked. In Terracotta, it is locked, meaning, and coherent, meaning when I do a get, the cache is locked, so that no one can be removing that key while I'm mutate, while I'm getting it. That cache, it, that key is really in the cache. So I'm locked for the duration of the get. And then I'm locked later for the duration of the put. It's like a select from a database. Okay, so if you get a get on this machine, get on this machine, mm -hmm. modify on this machine, modify on this machine. You have a race condition. Yes, you do. In terracotta or anything else. The answer was That's just, fine. I just um, wanted to make sure that. I was but there's an explicit locking package, is what I said next. Right. So and you, you could, could. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so you could do get, which means. Go get an, an explicit lock on the key, hold on to it until I call put, which That's means just, all other gets are blocked. So no one else can read it while you're reading up there, right. right? It's like select or update. No one else can get it while you're preparing to write to it. Or the optimistic lock. Yeah. So I do a put pending same version. Yeah. But that's what, 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 what well in EH cache by hand, what you do is there's, right now, there's not a true optimistic concurrency, meaning there's no put, there's no cast. Only put this if the existing version in the cluster equals that. We're building cast right now. So what you do now is you do a get, mutate, mutate, mutate. Then you do a lock, get again, check the version, and then put. Can you um, do that with the decorator? Yeah. You got it. Well, that's how we're going to do cast. Cool. So you asked me to cover NoSQL? Yes. So EHCache, I mean, there's a slide on it, basically. EHCache and Terracotta gives you a NoSQL store. Why is that? Because Terracotta's got the superset of all your data. EHCache is doing eviction, but only to manage the avoidance of UMI out of memory in your JVM. So uh, in order to remove something from the cache, you have to call cache.remove on a key value. But EH cache in the local JVM can evict things out of memory back to Terracotta without actually removing them from the cache. And it's a trick we do to manage memory, but the short of it is, until you remove it, it's not gone from Terracotta. Thus is a strong advantage to Terracotta being disk backed, because I could store terabytes in a very small footprint, right? I had a customer last week say, I have 240 gigs of data. I've had coherence in here, I've had biggest spaces in here, I've had gemstone. First question to each of them is how big a cluster do I need to store 240 gigs of data? And everyone gave them the exact same answer and I was able to guess their answer without him telling me, which is, I don't want more than two gig heaps for pause times, right, to keep pause times low. So 240 divided by two equals 120 machines. But they have to put two machines worth of JVMs on every machine because everything needs to duplicate some other guy because it's a mesh, it's a grid, peer to peer. So back to 240, right? So when I said best case, they'll tell you 60 because they'll, they'll be willing to run something like, you know, four gigs or something per year. And he said that's exactly what they said, something between 60 and 240 machines. And the answer for how much terracotta you need to store 240 gigs of data with 50-50 read write mix at 1K per key the answer is something like six boxes, each running one active and another stripes mirror, because we've got it on disk. Yeah, a lot more disk than those. But. Yeah, but the difference would be, in their case, it will be all in memory, and 
in your case, it would be a read through the disks. Right? Totally fair assumption, but the trick we did for we do for large data sets is small arrays, lots of RAM. But we keep that RAM away from the heap. So we've got the data on disk, and then what we do is buy enough RAM for the box so that that's, let's say you have 240 gigs and six stripes, like I said. So that is 40 gigs per stripe. So I want 40 gigabytes of RAM on that machine because I'll cache all the data in that stripe in the file system buffers. So all reads will come from the file system, all writes will be logged forward to the end of the disk, and the JVM still needs to only be two gigabytes. So totally fair assumption unless I add that kicker that since we're file based, we, we get benefit from OS file buffers. Can you say a little bit more about this two gig issue with the JVM? I mean, I'm not as familiar with the issues, I guess, with the, the this is a J Java garbage collection issue that it pauses too long. The garbage yeah, if you have totally a good. two gig, if you have like a six gig JVM, sixty four bit, you can get a couple of seconds pause on a modern machine. Uh, and it depends on the collector you're running. If you run um, sixty four bit and concurrent mark suite, then the whole commitment from the JVM is that I will not pause you unless I'm about to boot. So I will concurrently mark and sweep memory while your application is mutating it and reading it. And I will try to read pack memory and defragment memory. But if I can't defragment it, I will pause it. Because okay. uh, you're accessing it too fast for me to get in there on a page and move it before you access it again. That's the concurrent mark sweep collector. So it typically goes a week. Uh, if you go below 3 gigs is what Sun says. Below 3 gigs it'll work and pretty much not pause. Above 3 gigs it'll start pausing randomly on you and could pause for minutes at a time, full pause. So then they have the other option which is the parallel collector. And the parallel collector always pauses all over the place. The, the advantage of it over the concurrent mark suite is I get to dedicate cores to the collector. So it's going to pause in sections. It's going to parallel collect sections of the VM and try not to do full pauses. So like we like to give customers 16 core machines, eight cores dedicated to the GC, and eight cores to the Apple. <laughs> wow. Then you can get an eight gig VM that pauses for 50 milliseconds on average, worst case 500. Does that answer your question? Yes, very interesting. Question about the uh, file buffers. Mm -hmm. It looks like if you are uh, reading from the file buffers, uh, we incur double the, uh, the deserialization cost because we have to deserialize the from the disk into JVM and then uh, serialize it for the wire. Transfer. No, we pack to the disk in binary form. We pack native terracotta data into the disk. So what the file buffers are the same as what we would have in there. They're equivalent. They're just outside the GC. <coughs> cool. So what do you guys think? Did I cover interesting stuff? Hey, well, was the uh, rewrite slide you had earlier, was that, uh, did you say that was 90-10 or was that the 50-50? 90-10. 50-50 looks horrible. Needs to be rewritten. Okay. Rerun. Needs to be rerun. Um, Does the database outperformed or what? The database never outperformed anyone ever. That is, you know, if you're questioning is distributed caching come of age, that's why. Because we at Gigaspaces, Terracotta, Coherence, JBoss Cache, actually, Java. the database outperformed JBoss Cache. But that's because JBoss Cache needs to be in broadcast and validation mode to scale past two nodes. And so it's almost never getting a cache hit. So it represents mostly overhead, extra call stack. Uh, other than that, you know, all of us beat the database all the time, all the way down to 50, 50 read write mix. Um, in terms of why we want to rerun the benchmark is because we have debottlenecked a lot of our system. And once we body age cache, if we understood what we are for, what's our purpose, it's to get in and hibernate, get in and age cache. Now it's no longer trying to find a benchmark. We struggled for benchmarks. Now the answer is just run enterprise apps that are making EH cache calls or hibernate calls. I don't have to construct an app that represents a lot of locking, but a little bit of writing or a 
lot of contention and a little bit of read. I don't have to figure it out. I just have to have enterprise apps with decent schemas. Follow-up question for that, I guess. I mean, it's, it's surprising to hear you say there's none out in the database. There's something odd about your benchmark, because it sure looks like all I have to do is go to 250K on your line, and it looks like all your lines are going to cross, right? So is that just a function of the Oh, core that's the eight-node cluster. They will cross, but you grow the eight nodes up, and the database doesn't have an answer to that. You know, database clusters aren't really great, but okay. it is going down, and that, that downward trend can be corrected with more hardware. Go from eight to sixteen nodes, okay. and you'll straighten out the curve, and you'll cause a dip later in the curve okay. for more data. Okay. So more striping. Remember, I said it's yes. the, the EMC. Why would I take six terracotta servers and bottleneck them on one EMC, even the, and require a data storage guy to remap all that to yes, right. Right. Same concept here. If I run sixteen coherence boxes or sixteen terracottas, I've got twice the throughput of eight. Same Do you um, you don't currently support optimistic locking natively? I would sort of say. Are you planning to add that and to support um, transactions across multiple puts? Transactions across multiple puts, as I said earlier, is in the product. But only through locks. No, through JTA. But the, I get a but JTA only, uh, only through pessimistic I, locking, right? Well, if I want to update two caches, I want to do it inside a transaction, right? Well, I'm, not, I'm not talking about two caches. I'm talking about one cache with multiple puts, where they have to succeed together. One cache, together. multiple puts, two caches, multiple puts, cache in a database, all succeed or roll back. We do that with JT. Right, but how does the cache fail if you don't support optimistic locking? But at the end of your optimistic operation, however many pre prepared statements you got lined up, you want a transaction to commit them all in, right? Don't you? So you're saying I do optimistic concurrency, which means I do a read, and then I trust that read from that point on, do a bunch of mutation, 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 then I try to do a commit where version equals X. And that commit across multiple JTA resources, you want it to roll back if all the versions you trusted at the beginning are not still there. That's a that's the same pattern you want, which is an optimistic built-in, but then the end commit that you're committing is a JTA commit. Multiple resources you want to you want to flush, right? So I've got cache A, cache B. I read them at value one, at version one, both of them. Then I get to the end and I want to flush where cache A equals one, version equals one, cache B version equals one and I want to commit both or fail. So I'm saying that transactional logic is JTA right, but, in your commit. But you're saying that we have to write that logic knowing JTA to, ca to cause the transaction to fail because we don't we don't currently have... Oh, because there's no notion of a terracotta session with the database. That's hibernating. You're asking us to recreate an ORM <coughs> you load up a bunch of primary keys. So I was talking specifically about the NoSQL space. Oh, okay. okay. There's no hibernate in the picture here. It's just EH cache and terracotta, and I want to do a yeah. transaction Fair across enough. multiple puts. Yeah. I mean, we, we did not think about it. We, I'll take that back to the product management team. Yeah, because with the database, the answer is, <clears throat> with an ORM, the answer is you've got to put JTA into your right. flush logic. That's what I was trying to say, but I jumped to that you're talking about objects and databases. We're talking about MC. Yes. 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 How about some sort of a GUI language or support for uh, MapReduce type of operations? So, MapReduce and queries, there's a whole dark world of Terracotta called Terracotta Integration Modules, which is the precursor to EH Cache, and what I'm now saying is simple. The Terracotta integration modules have, you'll find it at forge.terracotta.org. There is a MapReduce framework that scales well, and there is a query environment based on Lucene. Right now where we're heading, we're not quite sure, but we, we've broken down the world as far as we can tell into people. There's a lot of people who ask us for query, right? And we don't have it per se built into EHCache. So the question is, how are we going to do it? 
right? Is it going to be Hibernate query language? And is it going to be a scatter gather where we go out into all the nodes trying to get them to do the sub queries for us? Are we going to have the terracotta array do the query where the data is local, right? And what we found is there's simple query requirements and there's basically what turns out to be analytics when you start replacing the database, right? And the simple query guys are basically saying, look, I do get by key, but I also want to do where get where key equals a pattern. Some kind of regex, right get a star, right? And get a key set or, or something like that, or an iterate over. For those guys, the um, there are a bunch of open source search frameworks, all of whom have uh, asked to join the Terracotta family of frameworks, and we'll probably end up clustering one of those. And I can't say yet how we're going to get it to scale and all of that, because we just haven't gotten into it. But I can tell you that for those simple guys who want to do get a star, for example, some simple regex language on top of the cache get, um, that stuff is going to be built by our next release, which is somewhere between November and January. So for the very next GA major release of the product, we'll have a simple search. How about just the attributes? So if I want my uh, yeah, that too. That too. I want to index on something other than the key. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's part of what we call simple search, where you're saying, I've stored it by ID, but I want to get at it from this other field. Right. And I want to generate an index on that other field, perhaps later in time. I'd say, how about multiple attributes? Yep, yep. Being able to do it, all of that is, is in scope. What we're not worried about right now is things like continuous query. I want to be notified when the system gets something that matches into the cache that matches this pattern. Those are more advanced search things that we're not doing yet. Are there reasonable limitations on what size or type of object you should put into the cache? Yeah, multiple kilobytes per object is okay. I'd stay below 20K per object. We've had people put multi-meg objects in. Our network communication protocol really has not been tested at that, and it meets the JPM. Uh, if you push it to a lot of multi-megabyte objects changing at the same time, because we do so much matching and network optimization that we end up trying to get memory buffer, uh, network buffers on the order of like, 100 megs and a JVM Kadoopy. So I would keep the, the data sets retest all the time at 1K and 5K. So I'm comfortable below 20K in terms of key value pairs. Total elements in the cache below a billion and 1 to 10 terabytes we can handle. I think I failed to, to call on you several times now. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, as, uh, I had a question like I asked at the beginning, like regarding the complexity of the deployment of Terracotta. Oh, okay. Like in most shops, uh, you have like you know several applications that you know with like a couple of gigabytes maximum worth of data, mm -hmm. and then uh, in my case, I mean like I have like eight of them, all of them are off and running twenty four seven. There's absolutely no downtime, and very often I have several different versions of my application in production. Every deploy that I have, I keep the old release for a couple of days mm -hmm. in case like, something is wrong with the new release. So with two different versions of the application, we couldn't connect to the same uh, Terracotta. And then, so that required us to have at least four Terracotta nodes production per application. And then, uh, because for each application, I had to have another set of four terracottas that brought some complexities that have to have another kind of a lot of folks. Another problem is uh, to replicate from the uh, um, active master to passive master that is recommended to have direct connection. And so because we use like virtualization, like I kind of like don't have control over like where my host is. So that creates another complexity which like, kind of like, slows down the ride to the node because of the like, node. Uh, it has to get propagated so that from uh, active to passive. Mm -hmm. So um, the two questions were, first, uh, I needed a bunch of Terracotta servers to have different versions of my apps running in production at the same time. The answer there is that's old school Terracotta platform. 
where you're doing transparent clustering. Um, and it has a very hard requirement. When the clients and servers all come up, they actually handshake as to what version of Terracotta is installed in the Terracotta driver versus the server. And they will refuse to talk to each other if they're not a perfect version match. Um, that's not the case anymore. So a Terracotta is moving towards a backwards compatible world where clients can be, clients are rolled through today. The rule today is different from the rule you experienced at some point in the past. Uh, so instead of a hard match between them, it is minor numbers. So Terracotta is at 3.3. So 3.3.x can talk to each other in the current Terracotta world. Where we're headed by December is full backward compatibility, which means anything newer than, uh, you know, servers and clients will negotiate the protocol level that they can both support, which is what you would expect. So we're not perfect there, but we're getting better. Uh, we have these guys, is anyone here from Electronic Arts? No. So Electronic Arts uses Terracotta open source in production for uh, Need for Speed. Uh, so the, uh, to the scoreboard as to who's got the fastest laps, best times on tracks, and the ability to buy cars and stuff like that, those microtransactions, that's all built in Hibernate. And EA requires, so when they release a game, uh, they release the back-end micropayment system and scoreboarding, shared scoreboarding service with that game, and it's locked forever. They will not update it again unless a bug is found in that particular game. So there's not a shared micropayment system for all the EA games. It's EA for Need for Speed 2, EA for Need for Speed, you know, Hot Pursuit, EA for, you know, payment system for whatever, Sims, payment system for Sims Carnival, each of those payment systems represents a different hibernate. They have an OSGI layer, which I can explain to you offline, basically allows them to load all those different hibernate jars, all those different terracotta jars, keep them aligned, have them speak to the same array without downtime. And they basically, I think they've got the most complicated hibernate that Spring Source or Terracotta ever saw. They have 34 different hibernate jars loaded in the same JVM, which we've never seen anywhere else. And it works. So we are getting better than it works. Your second question was... Was you going to like, deploy Terracotta in like a, with like, uh, on top of not real hardware, like on top of like virtualized type now, OS? When did you try it? Uh, like, I, I, it never got to production because of these issues. But I mean, like based on your recommendation, it's required to have like direct connection between the uh, active and passive masses. Mm -hmm. Uh, I won't ask you who you spoke to. But no, it's like, uh, I've never talked to anyone. It's just documentation on your website. So, um, Terracotta does really well at virtualization right now. We are running all of our QA inside the Eucalyptus. Um, they're speaking at the At Scale conference. We did some studies of Terracotta servers in Amazon EC2 <coughs> coming back to our servers, uh, back to our site, and asking for updates. Uh, and bug fixes, and there's 3,300 unique Terracotta servers running in Amazon right now. So virtualization should not be a problem for us. Uh, if it doesn't work out in the box, there are some custom knobs you can set for how to prioritize application workload coming at the array versus internal replication workload. It's a uh, replication batching setting. If you look at TC properties in tc.jar, in lib there's an embedded TC properties file you'll see a replication batching window. You can change that batch and make it much bigger or much smaller. I think it's set to send 500 objects at a time, which is great for physical hardware. For virtual hardware, you wanna change that perhaps. And depending on your app workload, that's why the settings there are not for virtualization, but because you'll have client customers who will say, I want the array to be healthy and green at all times. I don't care what the application is asking it to do, keep yourself healthy. If I lose a node when it comes back, image it as fast as you can. You'll have other customers who will say, I can't afford a lot of hardware. I want the system to be snappy to end users and do its best to try and stay up. It's not as mission critical a use case, something like that. Thank you. So there is a batch in the TC properties you can customize. Anything else? All right. Uh, well, I guess with that, thank you very much.